I understand that a liberation movement does not see itself as one party amongst many. It sees itself as the authentic representative of the people. The economic freedom fighters are good at grabbing the headlines, but what are the ideological roots of the organization and what is its longer term strategic objective for South Africa? Joining me to discuss is Terence Corrigan. He has written a lengthy piece for the Daily Friend online newspaper, which delves into the ideas and strategy underpinning the EFF. Terence, welcome to the CRA. Could you tell us firstly, what is your view on the current conduct of the EFF and what does that tell us about its overall strategic objectives? Well, I think that the word, which would probably be familiar to many YouTubers and to the generation that enjoys YouTube, is they see themselves as disruptors. Uh, but, you know, not in the sense of, uh, you know, creating a new, a, new, a new product or service. They are, they are positioning themselves as, the disru- as disruptors of the entire uh, uh, political order. Um, they are seeking to cloak themselves in a mantle of radicalism that uh, they believe there is, a, there is a market for because of the dire conditions in the country, dealing with a population where nearly half, half, uh, half the working age population is unemployed, where we've seen lackluster, if any, economic growth for uh, for the you know for, for over a decade, and um, they see and, and what what they are um, pitching their reputation on is providing a sort of counter narrative and backing it up with action. We often hear this, you know, we don't want words, you want action. Well, you know, they've uh, been willing to uh, to vandalize stores, to ignore court orders. Um, in a way, it sort of harks back to the remark that Osama bin Laden made you know, 20 years ago. And if you see a weak horse and a strong horse, you bet on the strong horse. Even if you don't particularly like the, like the policy offering, they seem to have momentum, energy, vitality. This is, um, I think, how a lot of, you know, sort of anti-establishment movements, um, uh, movements operate. Enjoying this analysis? Click here to sign up for our 30-day free trial for more content from the CIA. All right, Terence, well, in your piece, uh, you spent some time reflecting on the recent uh, inquisitions that the EFF led against uh, immigrants uh, working in restaurants and with scenes of restauranteurs kind of prostrating themselves before the, the, the EFF representatives. A lot of bullying behavior, a lot of uh, intimidation and even uh, threats of violence. But what do you think are the origins of this? So what, uh, how is these kind of tactics being used as, as a political tool? It goes back into, into our political culture. Um, obviously, you know, before, be, before the, tra- the transition to democracy, we had what can aptly be described as a low-intensity civil war. Um, the ANC in particular, uh, along with the, uh, with the PAC, the, 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 uh, the influence is probably not that profound. Its central offering was that it was uh, it was struggling profoundly for liberation. It was uh, you know conducting an armed struggle. Um, now this was very largely a, um, a propaganda thing. There's there's no real evidence that uh, um, that they ever seriously threatened um, threatened the state. Although you know other things like the like the township uprisings, the just general refusal to um, uh, to cooperate and the Internal contradictions of um, uh, of the of the then exim system, you know, brought brought to its knees. But for a liberation movement, this is what the how, how the ANC has seen itself not a not a mere political party. It is an expression of the people, and uh, it must encapsulate that dynamism. Um, it needs to uh, present itself as being everything that is good and noble against everything that is evil and vile. And the idea that they had, that they had taken up arms and um, in, in in pursuit of of liberation was a, a, a was a very big part of that. It comes the transition. Well, that that is the uh, you know one of the one of the planks upon which uh, its 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 legitimacy is hedged. That it is the party that brought uh, uh, that 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 brought justice, uh, liberation, etc. And from there we go on to um, uh, to this constant invocation of history. Now the EFF. It must be understood it was not an alternative to the ANC. In many ways, it positioned itself as a successor to it. 
Um, it's still, it, it uses a lot of a lot of ANC symbolism, the whole Winnie the Matikizela Mandela thing, that, which they apparently now call the headquarters. That was kind of an ANC symbol that they appropriate. And Anthony Butler has written quite, uh, quite recently, this was in about 2012, 2013, that as the generation that actually experienced this passes on, you know, the people who were in exile in Tanzania or wherever, as they retire, as they um, as 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 they um, uh, they go to the great beyond, that the sort of mitigating force of reality starts to die, and that mythology becomes almost self perpetuating. Um, and if, as the ANC has uh, has claimed, it is involved in an ongoing uh, battle for liberation, that if it's still confronting white monopoly capital or whatever you want, imperialism, whatever you want to call it. Well, the question can be asked, uh, how profoundly are you doing it? And the EFF is simply taking it to its uh, 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 to its next level. If indeed uh, the uh, the plight of uh, black people in South Africa is as a consequence of uh, uh, recalcitrant uh, white racist business people, then what the EFF does should make uh, should make perfect sense. What and their tactic is to then sort of take that to uh, 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 to the voting public and say, well, you know, we are. We are actually uh, we're actually enforcing this, and if this flabby, uh, dysfunctional constitutional democracy won't won't deliver it, well, we set hell with it. We throw it out the window, and you know we do something we uh, uh, we do something more direct. So, Terence, uh, you actually spend quite a lot of time in the article discussing the attitude of the EFF and the ANC towards the constitutional order. Mm. It's a bit of a mixed picture. Um, what yeah. is uh, what are some of the insights that you that you included there and uh, because it, what you just said around th this kind of contempt for the constitutional order as as something that is uh, restraining uh, the mm. the will of the people or or the true expression of the the interests of of the ruling right. party, uh, how did right. how did you explain that? Okay, well, uh, understand that a liberation movement does not see itself as one party amongst many. It sees itself as the authentic representative of the people. Now, understand that the people does not mean all Homo sapiens. It's kind of roughly analogous to the Marxist idea of a, you know, a class for itself. People who understand the, uh, you know, who, who have identified the, uh, the true interests and push for them. And even if not everyone understands it, you know, that, that is what the ANC and the EFF kind of, um, uh, kind of view themselves as doing. Um, now, you take this to its more, uh, its more dismal consequence in, in Zimbabwe, where you know, uh, e even if the, the MDC could, could 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 get a majority of votes, they are still viewed in that um, in that view as illegitimate. You know, it's stooges and whatever who vote for them, and and you know the army can say, well, we refuse to uh, uh, we refuse to salute the the uh, leader of the MDC. Okay, so that so you have a party that identifies itself as being an embodiment of something. The idea that um, uh, that an agreement reached with, uh, with, with various other uh, actors in society should restrain you, should restrain the people from doing what they, um, uh, uh, what is in their best interest, becomes almost, uh, well, it, it certainly can become, uh, 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 become somewhat repugnant. Uh, this something goes back to the French Revolution. How, how can the people act against their own interests? Um, now, in the 1980s, we, we saw the flourishing of this phrase, the people. And it's very interesting if you if, if you go back and look at and look at the way in which it was used. You would have um, uh, ANC supporting publications like the New Nation or the New African writing about you know the conflict between Encarta and the people. You know it's almost as if Encarta aren't really people. You know they 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 represent some sort of malignant social force as opposed to the people. You get um, uh, uh, you get the point. Now they're you know, obviously, is a constitutional strain within the ANC. You know, someone like Kada Asmal, um, in a book I think was published about 1996, went to great pains to, to try and present the ANC as, uh, you know, an impeachable constitution, uh, a, a constitutionalist force. And they get a great deal of um, of kudos internationally for that. Um, and you know, however critical we may be, we we do have to acknowledge that the ANC has not acted like Zanu PF. You know, we do have functioning courts. Uh, the government does uh, uh, does usually listen in some measure to courts, albeit reluctantly. But there are also plenty within the ANC who have made no secret of the fact that they do not, they don't like the system. There was um, uh, Mr. Ramat Lodi about uh, about eight years ago who wrote that that celebrated piece that this was all a compromise heavily tilted against the forces for change. Um, uh, 
most serious thing about um, about judges and uh, you know mental colonization or whatever, you know you can. Uh, I think it's 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 quite a cleverly written piece in that uh, it, it does enable her wiggle room to say, well, she thinks this is a living document, or whatever. But I think fundamentally what she's saying is that the the system is deficient, you know, and invariably the answer that comes up is we want is that we want more power. I think it was in, uh, when uh, Manu, when he was the cabinet spokesman, was speaking in his personal capacity, which is the other great fig leaf in South Africa. So, no, we, we, we need to abolish constitutional democracy and introduce a parliamentary one. And I think that is ve a very, very appealing idea. You know, we've got the numbers, you know, middle finger to everyone, we'll do what we want. Um, and, you know, the implied promise is that when we have this power, we'll be able to make all things, make all things better. I think it mistakes the, the, uh, the nature of South Africa's problems, but you know, it's it's the kind of um, it, it's the kind of offering that this faction or this community puts on the table. Terence Corrigan, thank you very much for joining us on the CRA. Let's hand over to you, our viewers. What do you think will be the impact of the EFF on South Africa's politics? Leave your thoughts in the comments section below. We've also included a link to Terence's article in the description, as well as in the pinned comment. I do encourage you to check that out. It's a fascinating read. My name is David Ansara. This is the CRA. Until next time, take care.